we are just a minute or so after seven, and it looks like we uh, have enough for a quorum. So why don't we call the roll and uh, get moving? Maria Ryan. Here. Bart Bartles. Here. Morgan Johnston. Here. Todd Rusk. Andrew Stumpf. Here. Pam Wojtek. Stephen Wald. All right, we have a quorum, so uh, I'd like to start maybe with just a round of introductions. I mean, I know that uh, there are people who know each other on an individual basis, but just so that, um, just to be sure that everybody knows who everybody is and that anybody who's uh, watching us on TV would also know. Uh, I'm Maria Ryan, I'm um, Chair of the Sustainability Commission. Hi, uh, Bart Bartles. I work at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. I'm Morgan Johnston. I am the Director of Sustainability for Facilities and Services at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Hi, I'm Andrew Stumpf. I work at the Illinois State Geological Survey. Sustainability Coordinator um, and resident of Champaign. So, thanks. Cassie Carroll, I work at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center and also a resident of Champaign. I'm Peter Christensen, I am a new resident of Urban West Urbana and, and um, just joined the faculty in the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics. I do energy economics here at the University of Illinois. I'm Scott Tess. I'm the Environmental Sustainability Manager for the City of Urbana, and I'm staff to this commission. And I think I heard, is it Peter Mur Murphy who's on the line? Joining us by telephone? Are you there? Yes. Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, great. Yeah, uh, yes. And if you just want to introduce yourself and your affiliation. This is Peter Murphy from the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. Uh, I'm the market development coordinator there. Great, thanks. And what we'll do um, is we'll go ahead and um, we have just a couple of kind of housekeeping items to go through. Uh, and then when it comes time for our discussion, um, any of our invited guests will just, you know, participate in the discussion. Uh, I think the only thing is if we would need a formal vote on anything that would simply be restricted to the commission members but otherwise we'll just uh, carry on the discussion as usual uh, are there any changes to the agenda okay and just to note since this is a special meeting we're not doing our uh, minutes from last time where our staff report will hold off on that until our regular meeting on october 6th and uh it does not look like we have any members of the public here who wish to address us and so let's um, move to communications. Do we have any communications? No? no. I have one. OK. Um, uh, the sustainable water management plan that this commission passed um, a year and a half ago, maybe now, uh, won an award from the Illinois chapter of the American Planning Association in the sustainability category. Great. And, uh, uh, you know, certainly already communicated to Scott uh, how grateful the commission is for the hard work that he put into that report. And, you know, certainly an effort by a lot of people. We had so many uh, different uh, people come to address us as a commission through the formation of that, of that plan. Uh, a lot of people from various agencies, university, uh, water survey, a number of others, uh, and uh, other members of the staff, Bill Gray and um, Scott Bennett. So uh, I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of people's input went into that. And so it was really uh, good to see it uh, recognized. All right, well, let's turn to our continuing business, which is uh, to review and determine the UC seller request for proposal uh, provisions. So Peter has uh, a few slides prepared that um, will, sh will uh, kind of guide us through where we're at um, up till today. And uh, I'll turn it over to Peter. All right, sounds great. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. There's a, a little bit of an echo in the uh, in my headset, so I'm just gonna set that down and uh, go through my slides. Um, 
and I'll um, if if there are any questions, I'll I'll uh, put the headset back on in between each slide. How does that sound? Sounds great. All right. Okay, so um, unfortunately, my colleagues Marcia Lockman and Sarah Wokas uh, from IGEN and the Environmental Law and Policy Center are unavailable tonight. Um, like I said, I'm the market development coordinator for Midwest Renewable Energy Association, and I've been handling the RFP process uh, with the others I mentioned, uh, as, as well as with Scott. Um, and the Midwest Renewable Energy Association will be the contract holder for, uh, for this program. So, um, Scott, is that is are we on slide one right now? Is this the title slide for solar for Urbana? Yes. Great. Um, so you can advance to slide two. Um, this first slide is just to reiterate what this is all about for those who are new to the group. Um, the big picture is that we group a bunch of homeowners and business owners together um, so they all go solar at the same time. And the more folks who participate, the lower the cost is for everyone. To do this, we work with a single solar installer on all the projects. And then we do a strong public-facing education and information campaign, which primarily involve, involves uh, hour-long info sessions called that we call Solar Power Hours. Um, and we try to work with local partners as much as possible on the outreach that we do for those. So if there are any questions as to the general model, um, feel free. No, nope, thank you. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying, go ahead. OK. Uh, slide three, then. Um, this slide may not be the easiest to read. Uh, and most of you have seen it already uh, on, on September 8th when we were there previously. But mostly it goes over the roles of various organizations. And uh, if you look closely along the bottom, it kind of designates what each organization will do. And it's mostly the work of the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, MREA to manage the program uh, then with support from local partners. So I just wanted to touch on that again. Um, if there are any questions, feel free. All right, slide four. Um, I've updated the timeline from last time. Everything has moved up just slightly, a little bit, um, uh, a little bit more in advance. So we'll be publishing the RFP next week uh, on, on the 29th. Um, it's then due from, from installers. Uh, the proposals are due on October 12th. So we will review responses on the 13th through the 15th. And then the MREA will finalize a contract on October 16th. And the installer will enroll as a bidder in the IPA SREC auction around then. And then in November, they'll submit their SREC bid and we'll be doing marketing and outreach starting in December. And the installer will be working with customers after that and putting uh, solar on roofs uh, throughout the throughout next year. So if there are any questions about the timeline, go ahead. I have a quick question for you, Peter. So does sure. the, the RFP, does that actually include the scale of the, you know, the scale of the collective install? Uh, what do you mean? So are people bidding for a, uh, are vendors bidding for a, a uh, size of contract in terms of numbers, number of installations? So they're, they're basically bidding, I mean, we have, we have articulated a goal of 100 to 200 kilowatts, um, but the installers are, are bidding on the amalgamation of all the business that this will that this will represent for them right. so it's it's not a specific it's that it's that range but they're bidding on uh the prospect of having a lot of business you know relatively short period of time if that if that answers your question yeah that that makes a lot of sense uh so you sort of set the target that is a range that's sort of a reasonable range and how how do you determine i guess i, I haven't heard how you determine what the kind of total demand for this will be, how many installations, where to kind of set that target. How do you know that you're not going to be shy or or one way or the other? Lower sure, high. that's a good question. 
So, uh, were you at the last meeting? No, I wasn't able to be there. Actually, I learned about this after that. Okay. No problem. So, uh, basically... So, I'm the guy you haven't heard from who's going to buy one of these. IPAS rack of 80 kilowatts. And we have done, between um, Environmental Law and Policy Center and the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, we've done a number of group buys. And then we can look at trends. (laughs) Excuse me. We can look at trends um, elsewhere in the country. And um, my colleague, Sarah Wokus, at... uh, Environmental Law and Policy Center. She suggested we we do we shoot for um, 160 kilowatts, but it was the determination of this group um, on September 8th that we would start with uh, 100 kilowatts, and then if there was uh, a PPA option, a power purchase agreement option, which changes the finances a little bit and opens it up, it basically makes it more accessible to more people uh, financially that we would have a goal set for 200 kilowatts. Got it. Peter, if I could jump in. Um, The RFP will ask the vendors to give us a per kilowatt installed price. We will make some representations of how much we think, you know, what our goals are going to be. But we're not on the hook for for delivering any amount of contracts. Great. Thank you. And in the event that we have... um, far more or any any more installations um, or more kilowatt capacity in other words than the installer has bid on there's another uh, there's another auction in March that the installer will be able to uh, bid on or participate in so so in other words we can accommodate uh, a greater capacity if we if we surpass our, our goal got it and on the on the flip side of that coin, um, we're not this group. I should say is not on the hook for for its goals. It's the installer is taking a risk by um, bidding on this program. Uh, with you know, they have to they have to basically figure out for themselves how confident they are that we'll be able to achieve our goals. So if we if if the program is unable to reach 100 kilowatts, for example, and they bid 100 kilowatts. Uh, there's a there's a an expense that's associated with that um, that bid that they would then be on the hook for. So the contract will specify the installed price, but not the qu- actually the quantity of panels to be installed. Right, it's based on price, and I'll get into that a little bit. Great. Um, so let's go to slide five. So um, just basically, I just want to go over a handful of salient points in the RFP. Uh, you, to, to my knowledge, you've all received it, um, and if not, you you will receive it after this meeting. Um, it's a draft. Um, the proposals will get will have a dollar per watt purchase price that we'll use to compare installers, and the installers will be offering free site assessments for participants. Um, and there's nothing coercive about our model at all. So nothing about getting a site assessment for your home says that you have to move forward with an installation, uh, which is kind of nice. It, it basically gives a customer an opportunity to um, get a real sense of how much it's going to cost. And then if they, if they feel inclined, they can shop around. They can get multiple bids from multiple installers. However, we will be contracting with a single installer. That's how we achieve. Um, it, historically, that's how we've been able to achieve uh, really sound pricing. Um, and then finally, the installation firms need to be certified with NABSEP. Um, they need to be licensed, bonded, and assured, and they need to have a proven record as quality installers. Next slide, please. So to get an apples to app, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think you're good to continue. Oh, okay. I thought there was a question. Um, to get an apples to apples comparison of the installers, they have to submit sample systems for these four addresses. Uh, we have three residences, one each in Savoy, Champaign, and Urbana, and then a commercial building with a flat roof in Urbana as well. And the next few slides uh, 
show each building just so you can get a sense of what we'll be looking at. Um, and yeah, we'll, if you want to just go through these handful of um, sample sites, just so everybody gets a, a picture of, of what building types we're looking at. Our targets are um, residential, solar, and then small commercial. So this, this last one on slide 10, um, it's Omni Prosthetics and Orthotics, <coughs> excuse me, at 502 South Vine. Um, and it's just, it's one of many um, flat roof, small commercial spaces. So any questions about that so far? All right, so moving on to slide 11, uh, program geography. Installations can take place anywhere within Champaign County and all municipal municipalities contained therein. Um, and it's really up to the installer whether they choose to include someone outside of the area. When we do this in Milwaukee, it's, it's a program that's um, promoted and officially sponsored by the city of Milwaukee but it, it ultimately helps Milwaukee residents, city of Milwaukee residents, if there are other participants in the greater Milwaukee area. And in the past, what we've seen is that the installers are more than happy to accommodate um, folks within the area. And it, just, it really just depends on their willingness to drive long distances for a job. So it's um, we can, if, if it's so desired by this group, we can make changes uh, to the RFP to contain a larger geographic area, but it was in our view with the recommendation of Scott that we would, um, that we would basically just guarantee this to anyone in Champaign County. Is this, um, we, we, Any questions yeah, I do have about a question. that? I have a question about that. We were curious about Rantoul, if, um, if the, if the uh, utility allows net metering, and I was curious about any of the other rural areas, if there's a, if they're Ameren or a different utility, if anybody knows. Todd and I have made an inquiry with um, folks he knows in Rantoul. Um, they had some other obligations, but they're going to get back to us, and we're going to talk about what's about our project and see if there's a way that we can um, get them to participate as well. And that's, and that's where I was just wondering if, if in that line or if, some, if somewhere in the RFP it just maybe mentions based on net metering capability or something like that, utility net metering. Yeah, we, if we get an answer from Rantoul about what they might be able to do, uh, it might be good to put it, put it affirmatively in the RFP. So saying Rantoul has a different utility company, but they are a participant or Rantoul has a different utility company and they are not going to be able to participate. Although it, it may not matter that we say anything because if Rantoul doesn't have net metering or doesn't have policies that are helpful, someone could still do it. It would just cost more. And if I, I suppose we could allow them to buy into our program and, and not get as good a benefit as Ameren uh, customers would get if that happened to be the case. That's a good point. So we, we don't necessarily have to write them out of it, even if they don't have as right. solar-friendly policies as Ameren. That's probably a good point. There's no risk if, I right. mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter for the RFP, really. Right. Okay. And right, exactly. And the installer, um, part of a site assessment is getting uh, a really clear picture of how the financials bear out over, over time. So, you know, even if you have, even if Rantoul, doesn't offer um, solar friendly policies um, and but we still have somebody from Rantoul who's really gung-ho about it and then they get their site assessment and they take a look at it and the financials don't bear out it's unlikely that they would move move ahead with that yeah. so I agree with Scott completely and um, Peter especially since you're on the phone it, you probably are not aware that uh, Andy Robinson who just asked you the question uh, from CEDAC has joined us and also it's Dennis Donaldson from uh, uh, Village of Savoy, thank you. We did some introductions at, at the beginning, so. Anyway, go ahead. Great, thank you. So uh, the next slide, slide 12, um, this is kind of the fun part. Um, the 
MREA has an in-house designer who came up with a handful of logos here. And Scott sent us the color palette for U of I, which she incorporated subtly into these logos. Um, but she asked the question, and I'd like to pose it to this group as well. Um, what can we do to make the logo more place-based or localized? And then also, if there's a favorite among the group that we could move forward on, uh, that would help us make progress toward building out the website. Uh, so we actually had somebody bring in some sketches here that are um, separate from what's on the screen. And I don't know how we can show it to you right now. <laughs> but, uh, Do you have a webcam? It's got a, um, like it says UC Solar, and then it has an arch around it as if the words UC Solar are in the middle of a sun, and it's a, maybe a third of an arch. And then along the outside of the arch is the horizon of the community with um, specific images out of our area, and then green space between them with birds and trees and um, maybe you things can like take that. Maybe you take a picture of it and send it to them and in the meantime pass it around. Yeah. I think yeah, my Andy's got it on his computer just, here. Um, if Scott oh, could somehow send me that sketch, either a picture of it or if, it's a, if, it's, um, if it's possible to get a file. Uh, and, then, and then maybe the designer who put it together, if we could connect with them and then I can, I can put them in touch with our designer, um, that might be a good way to integrate their ideas. Is that, is, so is the design that you guys are looking at, is that um, among your group, is that what you want to move forward with or something similar? We haven't all seen it yet. It's being passed around oh. presently. And this one's a little bit more square. I don't know if it, uh, the ones you're showing are sort of rectangular. This one's a little bit more square. I'm just curious if you, if you know if on your material if it matters or if we're just talking about the, fr the front cover or corner of a piece of paper. I, it would, maybe you can mention a little bit about where the logo goes. Sure. In our experience, we've had um, logo placement, uh, of course, you know, on a website, on pamphlets, um, typically there's there's the little logo tag, like what you're looking at on the right of the uh, the slide, and then there would be other graphical elements as well, um, or not. I mean, it, you know, it's it's up to you ultimately, but um, typically, I, I guess I gave my my designer the direction that. You know, we, we want this to be a versatile enough logo that we can put it on a yard sign and put it on the web, maybe put it on a business card. Um, but, you know, just versatile enough and simple enough that it's, that it's quickly recognizable that there's uh, some association with, with the locality, which we ultimately weren't able to really accomplish, I don't think. Um, and, and that it's, you know, attractive and... and immediately communicates what, what this is all about. Uh, Peter, is there a, uh, a need to stick or, or limit the number of colors involved in the logo? Uh, the only reason to limit the number of colors would be for the purposes of putting it on a yard sign. But, um, and maybe, I mean, I guess uh, along the lines of uh, making it more localized or place-based, keeping it in line with the colors that uh, folks identify with U of I, that, that might make sense. But if, if there are other ideas that we can, we can certainly try to incorporate them. Well, I could also suggest on the, on the logo, we could keep something like what's on the right hand side, but then put a cityscape of Champaign-Urbana with those videos as branding on the bottoms of pages, on the bottoms of signs. So we could use a simple logo just with words or, or with some sort of mark that, that marks solar, um, but then use the cityscape in different ways as a style suite uh, that accompanies the logo. So um, just as a suggestion, wanted to throw that in. And also, I know more colors equals more money and more expensive signs. <laughs> so just something right, to consider exactly. when we're talking about colors as well. So if we, have a, if we have a logo that starts out with a simple two color scheme, we could, and to save money on signs, generally speaking, what we've done in the past is we've just made it um, a gradient of one color and just kind of, it's, it's less effective, but um, we've made it work in the past. Um, and I totally agree with your other suggestion. You know, if my, I guess my question would be if any of the five on the right side of this, this slide are particularly agreeable versus the others, um, then that would be, I would, I would 
send that back to my designer and be like, all right, let's let's try to incorporate this one logo with the ideas that uh, the group had come up with. I like the middle one. Peter, this is Scott. Sure. I've just sent you two emails. One has a, a photo of the graphics that Morgan brought. And the other one is a link to the um, live web stream. This meeting is actually live tonight. It isn't always, but I just checked it is tonight. So um, that's another way you can get a visual of what's going on here. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, that was Andy put them together, and I just picked them up and made us all see them. <laughs> and so, so yeah, so the image, I, the image I sent around is basically is from a, it's not my image, it's from a, a conference. So I was thinking of the, the buildings there in blue would be all green. Later, I just added them to that, and then you can make the rest of it two colors or whatever. The, the, the issue or the question I had is UC kind of doesn't catch me as being Urbana Champagne. It's more of a, it could be University of California. So it's kind of not specific, I guess, in my mind, but maybe not. Are there other places other than the logo? Does that mean that that those that that would uh, appear that text would appear on the site? Because I agree that, well, being a, Cal a former California resident, that would be the first thing that I would think. And a lot of people are going to search, do Google searches, <laughs> and maybe come up with a site that directs them to the wrong place uh, and get confused. But that's only if it becomes text and not just an image. Uh, a really good point. We so if you Google UC Solar, there's the the first hit is pretty much always um, a University of California mm -hmm. site. So it really begs the question: Should we should come up with a a different name for this? And it's you know, Champagne Urbana or Urbana Champagne Solar is a little bit of a mouthful, um, but. I'm, I don't think we are necessarily, I don't think we need to be married to the UC Solar idea. Um, I just, I don't want to, I don't, what I don't want to see happen is that um, questions about the, the name and the logo uh, prolong the RFP process. And it's, it's a little bit of the tail wagging the dog. I think we can come up with uh, some solid um, branding without prolonging this process. Yeah, I don't suppose that that's critical to the, I mean, if we change the branding or the name after we select a bidder, I can't imagine that that's going to be critical. Or we could write it into the RFP that the name may be something such as UC Solar. Sure, I think that would be acceptable. Well, so when we first came up with the, we went with the name UC Solar at our first meeting about this um, early, earlier this month. And um, it parallels the UC Energy Star Challenge, and um, I I don't I don't have any concern about it myself. But I did picture it having the dash because that's what we all what we did for everything U dash C. Um, that would help with the search too. And um, so and and then I think the. You know, just in the in, if we want to just get this done, I would vote for this middle logo. If that's, I mean, as far as a uh, first phase. Let's uh, let's get everybody's opinion on on at least what's uh, what's on the screen here, and then maybe a vote if they like. Also, one of them that Andrew presented. I, I agree. It, it, the first ones you show, um, the middle one was the one I thought was better. That the top one, by the way, looks a lot like Amarin, um, <laughs> Amarin's logo and font. And that might be okay, or it might. Uh, my opinion was, it, we don't need to be identical to Amarin. Um, the middle one I thought was cool. Um, if we had a middle one that also had some cityscape associated with it, or an arch above it of the cityscape, if we liked that aspect. Um, the only question I had about Andrew's or the, the cityscape you had was if it was too intricate, and that was the other question: was this, if if intricacy makes a difference, or if simpler is better? I'm not. I'm not uh, sure about that. But I liked it. I thought it was cool, and I think it could combine with something like the middle one and maybe look uh, look even even more local. Or like Cassie's idea of, you know, it could be an arch, or it could be a bottom, or it could, you know, it could be a uh, a combination of some sort. I actually like the second one. I don't know if anyone else is going to vote for that one. 
Dennis, yeah. Tor? I also like number two. I have a clarification question on the fourth one. Uh, in your email, in your email, it had a ray burst behind it, and in the rendering here, it does not. So, which is, is that just the, an artifact of this projection screen, or? Uh, is, no, is I think maybe that one just got dropped or edited since, since oh, my email. Okay. But yeah, you could vote for I, that one I too. I personally like the retro one. Okay, so. Peter, that was the one with the red going around the the rectangular UC solar, right? Yeah, it looked more orangish to me. Reddish orange. Was, yeah. rays of was it the fourth one? The fourth one. Fourth one, but with the sunburst kind of around it. Yeah, I like that one too. Yeah, I like the second or the third one. I think the third one uh, is nice because the, the text isn't as chunky and the logo is a little bit more compact in one kind of solid block and can be used in a lot of different ways. And I think that even... It maybe to the left side, or if it's something that we incorporate in the style of our documents and produ productions, we can put that kind of cityscape in, and that would look really sharp. So Kate suggested in the third logo, um, the crescent could actually be the cityscape with the rays coming out of it. I don't know if there's enough, if it's too small to actually uh, show detail of what's actually represented, but it's an idea. Sure, I'll find out. I'm taking notes on all of this. And Andrew, what was the format that you um, put this together in file format? Yeah. Is it InDesign or? It was a JPEG in Illustrator. Okay, Illustrator. Right. Yeah. Okay. Do you have the original uh, AI file? I can send it to Scott. Great, that'd be perfect. Okay. So not a lot of consensus on the branding there. <laughs> Every time somebody speaks, I think I change well, my mind. Well, I think there were a couple that sort of, <laughs> it, it sounds like the first and the fifth didn't really get any votes, so <laughs> at least we limited. There you go. Yeah, Drop like the first and the fifth. I like number three. Wait, that's progress. What, yeah, I've got zero for number one and zero for number five, and then I've got two for the second one. And it sounds like I just got a third one for the third one, and then one for the fourth one. Or maybe two? Nope, just one. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just trying to look for the old one, see what the old one looked like. It's, it's being uh, shown around on one of our computer screens here. Like some working? variation on the right, third one okay. might be uh, the winner here. This is Andrew. That I think I like number two of the choices. Yeah. All right, so you got another uh, vote there. All right. How many yeah. people are in the room? I, I don't. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could go. I, I kind of like Kate's idea with going with. Uh, uh, it could be the second one or the third one, but including uh, something iconic uh, to Champaign Urbana. I think that would really look uh, look nice if it's not if it doesn't have too much detail. Is it um, is it is there a way to use a non U of I version of an I? As far as in Illinois, you know, uh, thinking of an icon. I mean, if you had an I with a solar on it at the end. Uh, or a, uh, I mean, U of I has a column. I'm just trying to think if there's a, uh, you know, I don't want to step on any U of I toes or imply that it's a U of I thing necessarily. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of a way to bring in a symbol. Uh, I, what are the iconic things in Champaign-Urbana that are not the U of I? And I don't mean that in an obnoxious way. I just don't know. <laughs> this was the courthouse. So you could have a column on one side and a courthouse on the other, or something. right? Or, or tip, uh, frequently there'll be a, a, a courthouse for the Urbana and a, and a city building outline. I mean, if we if we if we bordered it on two sides, and that's another possibility to border it with two buildings, perhaps. And you know, uh, I'm just thinking of simplified versions of the of the one that Andrew showed, and just trying to think about ways to to you know make it less detailed or simplified. 
Yeah, so there was the courthouse and the city, Champaign City building. And if you did two things, a thing on each side, you could almost do a ray, you know, an arc over the top. Uh, that's another possibility. I don't know if, I mean, that's something you might ask the graphic designer if, 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 they're, if they definitely want to have it on the one side or if it could go, you know, like a more of a sunset or a sunrise over the top of it or something. Uh, I'm not trying to reinvent everything. I'm just brainstorming ideas. That might make sense. Bitcoin? This is for the county, and it's the county courthouse, so maybe, maybe, oh, maybe that courthouse. fits in well. Oh. That's, that, that'd be Given fair. the nature of the sort of timeline here, and I know that you were saying, Peter, that it, it's important not to hold up the RFP. I mean, can this be sort of an ongoing process where there's a more minimal um, logo that maybe is decided tonight, and then that changes over time, evolves, or does it yeah, really need to be locked be in? I just, yeah, basically, you know, we're going to put together a website in the next week um, and we're going to be working on branding and identity and then outreach following that. So it would be, I think it would be unwise to change, change it too much after we've begun doing the outreach and marketing. Like anytime we have something public facing, I think it should be permanent and final. Um, but I think we've got a lot of good ideas and input for now and if especially if we can get that um, that original file from I think Andy was it I yep. can send all of these all of this feedback to our designer again and she'll have a lot more to go on uh, so I think we'll I think we have a good start and then you know we can touch base via email as well great do we want to um Move on to the other piece. Next slide. Sure. Yeah, I've just got one slide left. Um, oh, great. Next, we need to approve the RFP and then get to work with the website, local outreach, and organizing, like I said, and then setting up our solar power hours and marketing the program. Um, but because I just wanted to bring up, because of the shift in the timeline I mentioned earlier, I wonder if the group would, would be able to agree to meet sometime during that week of October 12th or possibly, alternatively, to designate one or two representatives to review the proposal with our team. Does October 13th work for that, Peter? Oh, yeah, that'd be perfect. OK. So um, our normally scheduled SAC meeting would have been the week before that. However, I will be at Illinois Public Service Institute training all that week. Um, so we wouldn't have a meeting that day, and we might be inclined to move that regular meeting to the 13th anyway. So if that works for everyone. All right. We might probably, yeah, just because it's a change in the regular schedule, probably run a vote on that. Is there a motion to, uh, to that effect? I move that we meet on October 13th at 7 o'clock. And cancel the... And cancel the earlier October meeting. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, changed. Thank you. All right, sounds good. And uh, another question, is everyone... Is I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure how how many people are in the room or to what capacity, to what extent I should say everyone can commit to reviewing a handful of our uh, RP proposals. It, I'm not sure how many proposals we'll get. It could be, I'm assuming it'll be in the range of five to 10. Um, and they might be pretty lengthy. I, I know, you know, just having done committee work for, for a while, most people are relatively extended uh, in their in their lives. It, it, would it so, be preferable to, the, to this group to designate a couple people who would be willing to commit to reviewing RFPs, or do we want to do it as, as this body? I, mean, I, I can commit to reviewing them um, as Morgan. It does say in the RFP, though, that they have to be, they can't exceed 20 pages. So many proposals I receive are hundreds of pages, so <laughs> this seems straightforward to me. Okay, great. I mean, yeah, it, some people, you know, some people don't have time to review 100 pages of RFP, or RFP proposals, and 
it's either way. I, I'm impartial. I just wanted to suggest it. Peter, would would it be possible to um, for our technical assistance providers, you and others, to um, distill the main points of the proposals into you know just a sort of a chart and present that to us um, in addition to sharing the the full text documents? Oh, I think that would be fine. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We'll, we'll we will have to ultimately we'll have to um, go through these proposals. On our own, anyway, um, with a with a rating scale and everything. So I I think that would be fine. And I just wanted to get clarification. The um, October thirteenth meeting would be the beginning of our of our review. This is not sort of turning on a dime where we would get the re get the proposals on the twelfth and need to make a decision on the thirteenth. Is that correct? Um, if we go back to the uh, slide yeah, back four, to the, Scott, to the schedule, uh, Cassie, can you, you go back to slide yeah. four? So, so we re re what's missing here is that we re received the uh, proposals at noon on October 12th. Right. So I'll go ahead and compile them all and then forward them on uh, to to the whole team, and then Scott will then forward them on to uh, you all. But then on October 16th, we have to finalize the contract with the vendor. So, so this is kind of turn on a dime. Okay. It, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be. It depends on how nimble we can be uh, right. via email. Or I assume that the group doesn't want to schedule an additional meeting after the 13th. Um, no, that's correct. The 13th and the 16th to finalize it. Yeah, I was just wondering whether it would be, you know, whether it would make any sense to bump it to the 14th. But that could even, I mean, the, it's a pretty narrow time frame one way or the other. Peter, a clarification, October 16th, finalized contract with vendor. Does that mean you make first contact with the selected vendor and begin to negotiate? Or does that mean negotiations need to start a day or two before that and you need to sign the contract with its selected vendor on the 16th? That's a good point. I would, I would say that probably the former. Realistically, it's, it's going to be, I, I mean, because we're sending Exhibit E in the RFP is a sample contract. So along with their uh, RFP proposals, they'll have the opportunity to send along any issues they may have with the contract. So it's not going to be un it's not going to be unfamiliar to them. Um, so ideally, they'll they'll be willing to sign a contract on the 16th. At the most, at the at the latest, the following Monday. Um, Peter, why don't I, Peter, it's, why don't you? It's a, it's a good question. I think the former would probably be, you know, making initial contact and saying, you know, you're our selected installer. Uh, here's the here's the filled out contract. Please sign and return. We're excited to work with you. Um, here's the next step. Peter, why don't we um, uh, in the next couple of days just add another line to the schedule that gives a like a, a hard due date for this um, advisory group to provide feedback comments Sounds so, good. so maybe that's the 13th or maybe it's the 15th or 16th okay may I ask is this a is this a one-shot deal you sign this what do you, you, mean you, you set up this contract uh, that's got a price per installed watt. The the uh, vendor uh, ha has to is going to enroll as a bidder in the rec au auction, but then there's another rec auction in you know six months down the line. So what we know from from the research on solar installations is that there's a lot of learning, especially when there are few installations in a particular community. So Hopefully, people are going to hear about this over time. It may take months. They might not be initially comfortable with the idea. They might have to really think through finances. It might be a year from now before you get you know, twice as many people, households that are interested in this. And I'm just wondering, uh, it seems like there will be a lot of infrastructure set up such that maybe that installer would like to have additional business, would be able to sell RECs, more RECs in next year's, even next fall's auction. It, 
Is there a constraint? Does this end? I mean, should I be telling people who might on our block who might also be interested that that this is their only chance, or is this kind of s creating an infrastructure that might be able to become persistent? I have two responses to that. The first and most important response is that the investment tax credit uh, ends on December 31st, 2016. So the timeline, I mean, when you look at the timeline for this, it's basically a six to eight month process. And while what you, you said, what you just pointed out is absolutely true. I mean, we, we see that when we do a pilot program, which you could call this a pilot program, when we do a pilot program in a, in a municipality and we do all this outreach, it gets a good number of people thinking about it as, and it gets a smaller number of people actually doing it, pulling the trigger and actually installing solar. But it gets a, it's a much larger number of people really considering what it would mean for them financially and whether or not they have a good site, all, the, all these other things that go along with this, or the, even, even down to how energy efficient are their homes. Um, so the, the reason where we're trying to keep this on a tight deadline and, and trying to get involved in the November um, SRAC auction is because we have basically, you know, when you, when you have a large number of installs scheduled, it takes a, a large, it takes a, a quite a bit of time for them to all get installed. So you want to build in that extra cushion so that everybody has their installs finalized. You, they've got PV on their roof and they've flipped the switch and turned it on before the end of the investment tax credit, which is at the end of this next year, like I said. The second, my second response is that yes, of course, when you do when you do one of these programs, you have the, the following if you if you follow up and do another group buy, you inevitably if, I mean if you're doing it right, inevitably you have more people signing on. And there's a handful of factors, you know, affinity groups, neighbors, um, Basically, when when one person installs solar, we see more people in their close proximity install solar, be it in their social network or just in their neighborhood, next door neighbors, neighbors down the street. I myself have, uh, at the end of my block, I've got a, a neighbor who has solar, and then just three or four houses down from them, another person has solar. And so we see this quite a bit. It's actually it's statistically significant that this that this happens. So that uptake. Um, really does occur based on, on proximity. So <laughs> I guess like, I guess long story longer, I mean, the, the investment tax credit is, is really a financial uh, boon so, and, and really can make the finances on, on some of these systems. And I would say, I think everybody would say like the, the projections for solar uh, adoption will probably fall right after the end of 2016 because when you you know you just figure like a 30 percent discount it's that's huge that it, on a on a 10 to 20 thousand dollar installation i mean it just it just represents such a large chunk of money that it it's it's i would I, I i would say that you could you could try to do another group buy because it's the it's aside from you know, bar, <laughs> barring access to the investment tax credit, it's the best. It's probably the best way to save money on uh, a number of solar arrays. Um, but without access to that investment tax credit, you're going to have far fewer adopters. So, sorry, that, I know that's a really belabored answer, a really long answer to your question, but I got I it. Like that's not worked into their their price per watt though that they're bidding for, right? Because that's all on the individual homeowner. Right. When you, when you uh, when installers bid on a price per watt, it's it's before any incentive at all. So right. So you know, the reason that the only reason I say that is that presumably that person you could write this and the reason I'm bringing it up is you could write this RFP such that they are you know, providing this not just within that short period of time, but a much longer period of time, more people, you know, that's just up to individuals um, what where their uh, decision will be made, whether they'll need to include that or not need to include it, or maybe there's something 
a year down, you know, a year and a half down the line that comes into effect. We never know what's going to happen with these credits, uh, the when we're going to see the next one. So I'm, I'm just wondering, are you going to specify in the RFP when this ends uh, in terms of the, the bid? Or so in the RFP itself, um, hang on, let me find it quickly. Because if so, then everybody sh who's involved in sort of getting the word out should know. Because w we need to tell uh, everybody we know that, you know, if you're at all interested in this, start looking at, you know, the numbers in your home, home sufficiency and so on now. Peter, if I could jump in and add two items um, to, to Peter Go Christensen's ahead. question. Um, one, uh, from a marketing perspective, sense of urgency is very powerful. So even though there's a sort of a Not second... Awful. <laughs> right. Th even though there's sort of a, a second chance in March with the additional SREC sale yeah. if it's needed, um, w that's not something we want to talk about because we want to um, we want to motivate people to make a decision sooner rather than later. Second, um, it really is kind of a, a one-time opportunity. Um, a as uh, Peter on the phone mentioned, uh, the production tax credit may not be here. And also, the SREC purchase is not a continuing state program. That's a one-time appropriation. Um, and there's, n there's, I don't know that there's any expectation. I think there's just two procurements. Is that right, Peter? And then it's over, the November and March? Uh, that would be a question for Sarah. Okay. It, it, it is a one-time appropriation of a specific amount of money, not a continuing program. Okay. I was, uh, in reviewing the... Um, RFP document, it wasn't clear to me, because I know when we were talking uh, at the uh, September 8th meeting that um, the idea was that the um, installer was going to have kind of have the right to the SREX for the first five years. And I didn't really see any mention of that in the RFP. I mean, I, I would think that would be a, an important element for the for responders to think about when they're pulling the pricing together. So I was just a little bit puzzled by that. Or maybe it's in there and I'm somehow not understanding it. I believe the right to SREX, um, sorry, there's this echo. I believe the right to SREX, I, I believe it's inherent to the to the way the SREC works um, and, and thus does not need to be written into the RFP, but I can follow up with Sarah, who is our the resident SREC expert. The terms of the SREC purchase are, are um, determined by the state, and it is a five-year um, purchase, and, and this installer won't hold them. The installer, installer passes them through um, and lowers the, you know, the cost of business, so to speak, or lowers the cost of the um, purchaser, um, and the state takes the SRECs and retires them. Well, I might have missed this at one of the last meetings, but in the RFP, in section number three, it purely just mentions homeowners. Are we counting small commercial spaces as homeowners in this? Because uh, that wasn't clear and maybe a consideration that we should put in because I know those are two different, totally different installations. Yeah, and I, I think we had also intended to be able to include even, you know, institutions that are, you know, not necessarily businesses because I, I think, at least my understanding was that it was more the size of the array rather than the nature of the purchaser? Um, uh, well, I'll mention briefly uh, what our, our discussions and our intent was, was uh, to hopefully get a bidder to make a proposal that would be per kilowatt for commercial and residential. Um, in terms of whether those are uh, uh, different uh, types of installations, I'll let Peter um, answer. Uh, but I will mention that, again, um, because, it's all, because this hangs, the competitiveness of this hangs on the SREC purchase, the SREC purchase well, um, from the state only applies to individual systems that are under 25 kilowatt in installed. Therefore, if someone's got a 50 kilowatt uh, commercial system on, on their mind, they're not going to um, be able to sell the, the, the SRECs from that system into the state and thereby probably wouldn't want to participate in our sale. Um, Peter, can you answer whether uh, under, you know, when we're talking about 25 kW or less, whether there's a difference for the installers between residential and commercial? And also the technical details of how we'll address that in the RFP. Uh, that's actually, that's a great point. Um, 
I'm I'm looking in section three right now, and it looks like in the third line, installation prices for residential scale PV installations are generally higher. Than blah blah blah. So um, we can, you know, we can we can incorporate that language. Um, but again, I, I would agree with Scott that um, I'm, it's I mean it's hard to say. You know, we we see an average of of three to really three to six kilowatt installs for residential and then commercial goes up from there so we can build that into that section I think that's a good I think that's a good suggestion well and I was also thinking along the lines of that maybe um, since this is for the vendor I don't know if different panels um, matter for different applications such as a home versus a, a business but um, you know we're working particularly this is the vendor RFP but maybe the installer RFP should also clearly note that as well. Just something to, to think about. I'm sorry, uh, specification about which panel to use? So I, I don't, I, that's what I'm, I'm not sure if there are different panels, if we're going to do. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it makes a big difference. Okay. Um, and, and you were just mentioning, making a uh, clarification of vendor versus installer. I think this is just, just the installer, or ju it's all the same thing, I think. OK, thank you for the clarification. I actually had a follow-up on that, though. I'm wondering if somewhere in this RFP we want to specify at least that these are domestically produced uh, panels and inverters or some sort of made in USA, um, regionally produced even, maybe give a preference for that um, if that's possible. I, I don't actually don't know the market around the region, but um, if there are manufacturers that could be identified, it just seems to me that leaving it completely open, are we going to get like the low quality Chinese dumped on the market <laughs> panels as the def you know default specification. Um, I'm really glad you brought that up actually. Um, in Milwaukee we always make room for um, what we, we basically we say that you have to make a bid on um, American made product um, and we it, where possible we try to specify regionally made products. So for example we have a uh, a company called Ingotine that makes inverters uh, right in, Mono uh, in the Menominee Valley in, in Milwaukee. So uh, in the past, uh, on some of the group buys that we've done, we've, we've specified that you have to bid every customer, you have to incorporate a quote that would, that would uh, account for the cost of using those locally, locally produced products. Um, in this case, we could do, you know, we could incorporate American made, or we could say Midwest made. Um, in, we, we've also had good luck. I mean, you can have, there's a lot of Canadian made components that are high quality, but um, pretty affordable. Um, it, that's also an option. So it's, we can discuss that. If, that's, if, if, you, if you all express that as a, as a preference, um, we can write any of those into this RFP, no problem. I think, I think that's, that's fine. I think that's Actually. fine, but I think consumers, at the end of the day, households ha giving households choice is key, but not constraining households' choices by making, creating, you know, forcing people to pay a premium uh, or forcing people to buy the cheapest thing on the market. I think, you know, providing some choice and providing some information is great, uh, but specifying that something is, you know, made within a couple hundred miles of here might really affect the, the price. I don't, I, I think that that's fine for the ultimate decision of purchase, but for the RFP, for apples to apples comparison between bidders, mm -hmm. um, I think it would make sense for us to specify a standardized parameter so we don't get a low bid that is artificially low because they've selected a low quality yeah, no, product, that's fine. whereas the regional. You could do a couple of tiers. So aren't there aren't there tiers of the ty the quality of modules like tier one tier two doesn't that exist? Yes, but it's subjective. Of tiers of quality of module, I would say uh, it would be tiers of regionality. So you'd say an American-made component versus a North American-made component versus a um, whatever they wanted to, to to bid, and it would likely be Chinese. Are there any uh, product certifications in this market that could be that would be relevant? I'm sorry, say again. Are there any product certifications that would be relevant 
as far as being able to distinguish quality? Yeah, so in the in the RFP as it stands right now, there's a and and in most basically the the uh, I don't know how to I don't know how to what to call this. It's the California Energy Commission has a website that goes through all the equipment that they accept, and um, they have a standard for for what's basically just what's acceptable. So it. It, essentially, it's, it's a rubber stamp to know that you're not getting something that's totally faulty or, <laughs> you know, ramshackle. Peter, it sounds like um, a, a lot of these types of programs have specified, from your experience, have specified American-made. Uh, the RFP has some language whereby uh, uh, vendors would uh, make representations of the types of products and manufacturers that they're going to be using. Um, and then I, I just wanted to mention again, um, just like when you specify re you know, a region for renewable energy credits, the tighter you draw the specifications, the higher the price typically. And this entire program is about uh, lowering the price so that more folks can get involved. And so I think a couple times we've mentioned maybe two tiers, and I think you mentioned that the Milwaukee program did that as well. So, I mean, is that would that be would that be a good way for everybody if we had a, a a lowest cost tier sort of that came from wherever that maybe maybe both tiers have to meet a California certification like you mentioned, Peter, um, but there would be a low cost tier and there would also be a I don't know thousand mile radius tier or something along those lines. And and again, I mean, it's sort of like buying a car. I mean, the, the components all the cells come from China. And it's sort of it's an assembly that is what we're talking about, right? Is that yeah, so we might see like a difference in price of you know up to twenty two cents twenty three cents between um, a Chinese manufactured component versus an, an an American manufactured component. So what I would suggest would be um, what I would suggest would be to have a, a, a tier for American made and a tier for um, whatever the installer wants to do. And that's no problem. I think that's great. I think ultimately, and I don't, I, I'd be curious to hear what your experience is, Peter, with other locations and, and communities, but what you'd want to obviously avoid is the situation where if you, if you just had one option but in the RFP and then you're making more options available to, to consumers, that they don't have to individually negotiate with the um, with the with the vendor because that can become either one way or the other. They w they really want to pay the premium, so they have to negotiate. You know what that's going to cost them, or they really want the cheapest product on the market, and so they have to negotiate. But they're being held to the 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 higher price, and that uh, it just seems like being clear. So you know if the two tiers is the clearest way to do it, or if if there's another way to just make sure that it's clear. Um, but it sounds like that sort of worked before that you do either, you know, anything made anywhere or made in USA. Maybe he'll call back. Uh, sounds like we might have lost the line. <laughs> um, We'll work on, on some of that language. Uh, one, uh, an additional critical piece to, the, to all the solarized programs is, prevent is as you described, as it can be a lot of complexity. Um, clarifying all of that in the programming and preventing a, a simple, straightforward program where there's uh, less options. Um, presumably, the program uh, managers have made excellent choices, so we've, we've uh, We've provided a, a high cost, or sorry, a high value, low quality, or and that's uh, high, <laughs> high quality, low cost panel. And that's um, where I think we've mentioned before about how there always could be add-on items if you need a new electrical box. There might be an add-on, and, and I think that's also discussed as you know additional Correct. items in the RFP. And this seems like this could just be one of those additional items. It, right. You know, in marketing materials and most of the materials, we'd probably talk about the cheaper option in examples. But if someone wanted the 
ten percent more expensive option, they could choose that. And if they needed a new box, then they would you know check that off as well. I mean, so there will be other additional items for people that need additional add-ons, yep. right? And that'll all be specified as fixed prices. Fixed prices, right? I was just going to mention just anecdotally. Um, the people I've spoken with, almost every single person that I think would be a good candidate, have almost all said, oh, yeah, I, I, I've been meaning to do my get a new roof in about the next five years. Will this be available in five years? And I say, well, there's this federal tax credit that is ending you know, within a year here. Um, you might want to go ahead and do your roof at the same time. And that just it's just good to realize it's an additional hurdle. And it's, you know, with those pictures that were shown, I kept looking at those pictures and I was thinking, does that look like a new, you know, I can't really tell from Google, but there was one that had some pooling on it, ponding on it. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder if that's a new roof or <laughs> not. And it's so just something to keep in mind that um, that's, you know, one of those other big hurdles here is that generally installers want there to be, you know, 15 or 20 years left on, on the roof. And that's uh, basically a new roof. Part of the uh, program. Well, customers should want that too. Oh, thanks, Peter. We thought we'd lost you. Know, you don't want to have to remove, pay to remove the panels and then pay to have them put back on. You know, when you when you replace your roof. So I had some questions about the RFP or comments. Maybe can I go through them now? We're good. Sure. Okay. Um, and throughout the text of the RFP, you say the Champaign-Urbana metro area, and then in one spot it says, uh, but we really mean the county. And I, I'm not sure if there's a purpose to saying Champaign-Urbana metro area. Why not just call it the Champaign County area uh, to begin with? Can we get that changed? Peter? Uh, I mean... Is there is there a uh, yes. reason to call it the in short? Champagne? Yes, I don't think we should put the uh, Urbana. I don't think we should put the Champaign County area. I think we should put Champaign County. Yeah. Okay. I just I don't I don't think that it's helpful. Um, I think it's confusing to sometimes say the Champaign Urbana metro area and sometimes say the county. Um, sure, I'll, I'll go through and change that right and, now. And it, it's throughout. It's in there at various places. Um, sort of in the same timeline or same same concept what Cassie had brought up was it was talking about the residential and we we definitely want to include commercial so just change adding the commercial there but it, it comes up a few other times once um, when it says here are four addresses but then it says give us the pricing for the three homes so we want the pricing for the commercial as well um, and that that's both in the text and in the Excel file and, and various places. Um, okay. And then, um, just to keep going, we have the, um, there's a place in there where it says that um, we'll, it, there's a blank about the local community outreach. Is that this group or is that a uh, yet, yet to be determined group or is that what? Maybe Scott, could you answer that? So th I think that, that portion of the RFP is going to be removed, um, and, and we're just not going to specify specific okay. groups. Uh, MREA is going to take the lead on um, public engagement, and um, everyone here is encouraged to support that public engagement. One of the best ways that um, uh, Peter has described that folks um, on the ground here can support public engagement is by getting people in their in their own neighborhood and in their own workplace involved and sharing the information. Peter, is that all accurate? Yeah. And so, if um, if any community group wants to have a uh, explanation of this brought to them, what's the best contact right now for the people watching live at home? Me. Okay. And um, so then also in the RFP, and maybe this is the same sort of thing, it's, uh, it started to list the community groups and it started to list the contacts from the different agencies. Does that, do we need to lock that in for this RFP to go out or is that fine? Is that kind of coming out as well? Uh, what page is this on? I don't know. I'm looking at my phone. Uh, what section? It's um it's close to this part where page, it has the blank for the community page three, and then it says XXX in the city section XX, four, page three section four. Okay, that's a that's an older version. Okay, so I've, we, I've taken out. So there's like the community. It's 
you know, City of Urbana, and then there's Community Group XX, and then however many employees, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that correct? Right. So um, I removed that just because it, it doesn't necessarily pertain. We don't have all the community groups lined up that we want to have, and we are going to be communicating that with them after the RFP is issued, so it doesn't it doesn't make sense to include a vague allusion to hypothetical community groups. You know, we don't know how many we'll have. Um, we could have six, we could have ten, or thirty. It, there's really no reason to put it in the RFP, so I removed all that. Okay. Um, the, another thing is, I'm getting close to my the end of my list. <laughs> another thing is the um, the time frame for the power purchase agreement option. Um, in the wh what I saw in the RFP, and maybe I missed it, didn't really say that you, we want a price for X amount of kil per kilowatt hour, but presumably there'd be an end point on that, not in perpetuity. So how is that, Scott? What? Yeah, I think you're right. There would be a time term. I don't see it written in the RFP, and I think it needs to be added. I don't know if that's five years with the SREC thing, or if it could be. The is it with so? In a PPA, she's talking about the term, the time frame for a PPA was probably more like 10 or 15. It, yeah, it can be much longer. It really depends. So that usually different terms are offered. But so, like so do we want them to tell us the cost per kilowatt and the number of years, or do we want to tell them for this number of years? So we, we need a blank for the, I'm getting nods. <laughs> I think you're right that we should <laughs> tell uh, have, it, have a blank for, for the vendors to specify it. Um, or we should tell the vendors we want a 15-year, but I don't think probably we should do it that way. We should let them um, be competitive and, and specify let a time specify. frame. Well, the, just a question then. If, if they specify, then how do we do an apples-to-apples -apples yeah. comparison? And I'm thinking of com comments that I've heard from large buildings that have gotten some solar in the last few years and, and some of their comments where it really is nice to have apples to apples comparisons. I, I think you can multiply that out and do an equalized cost of Peter Christensen shaking his head. Yeah. What, what is that Not term, equalized percent. cost of? The net uh, present value or something? Well, it, yeah, it's not exactly the net present value, but, it, but yes, you can, you, that's, a, that's a simple thing that we can provide consumers. The question is, though, the, the challenge to what you can't provide is, you know, some people, the reason that you might, lo might care about, you know, a 10-year versus a 15-year agreement is that some people might want the 15-year versus the 10-year agreement. So to have one body make that decision for everybody creates a bit of a challenge, and that's just something, I guess, that's going to have to happen. I think that's just... Now that I think about it. Well, why can't we do three, you know, five, ten, fifteen? The more complexity, the more, you know. There's a lot of questions in the. Yeah, sim simplicity is part of our, part of the, the sale. Um, we'll look at it again um, before we finalize that. If you do ten, the university might have an option to participate. Un it has to be under 25 kW installed system. Right, we, we have places for under 25 okay. kW. I only had one more question. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Does, so I know that, th that, we've, that um, they've done this in Chicago and Milwaukee, and so I'm just curious, did we take some lessons? Did you guys, uh, Peter, take some lessons learned from the Chicago and Milwaukee RFPs and incorporate them in this one so we were already not doing it for the first time? Is that true? Right, yeah. So I've, I actually have a, a meeting scheduled with the installer from Chicago on uh, Monday, and he uh, I'm working with the installer. This is kind of totally uh, serendipitous, but in in Minnesota, we're doing a, a large distributor-based discount. Um, it's a statewide program that we set up. Um, but the one of the installers that we're working with is actually Jewel Energy, and they're uh, they were working in Chicago on the Vote Solar program, and, and they actually they emailed me to say, you know, hey, we just did this large group buy and I have some, some lessons learned that I'd, I'd like to share with you if you guys are interested. So, of course, you know, I haven't mentioned Urbana at all yet um, simply because I don't want to influence their, um, you know, their bid on this. If, if they end up bidding on it, I have no idea. 
but I'm yeah we're we're looking at lessons learned specifically in the Illinois market. But yeah, and of course, um, our history with doing these group buys has informed the RFP. For example, in in the past we haven't had this apples to apples um, site comparison. In Milwaukee, we've we've looked at you know we get five or six installers that send us proposals and they've all got very different marketing materials and and we never use this um, this system where we have them bid on or make sample bids on four or however many sample sites I think this is a outstanding way to do this additionally Sarah Wochos from Environmental Law and Policy Center was involved with uh, the Chicago Solar Group buy, and so she's bringing those lessons learned to this. Um, one last question for me, at least on the RFP front, um, uh, in terms of the eligible applicants section, and I'm not sure if I've got the latest version of the of the draft, but um, uh, it's got the required qualifications but I'm wondering if we want a desirable qualifications element too where we can basically um, you know promote some of our regional programs do we want uh, do we want installers to be IGBA members for example would we want uh, to make a nod to some of the green jobs creation programs around here and have the uh, uh, local community college certified tech PV um, training certification as part of that there there are a few different things that could kind of be thrown in there to to uh, customize this a little bit more, I think. I don't have that list like off the top of my <laughs> That's head. What I was going to ask you for. Yeah, those those two things were the thing that came to mind. That you know, DuPage um, College has their uh, cert certified uh, photovoltaic tech, for example. <clears throat> so, it could be a way that I know that DuPage and other colleges that have put together these tech certificates have been really sad about not being able to get their graduates employed so if we could create a little bit of demand for them through the RFP process that would be kind of nice. I think I think that's a good idea. We should again consider the trade-offs of more of that type of specification might mean less people are able to bid. And that's why I'd say put it in a desired qualifications oh, okay. component sure. rather than in the requirements. Okay great. Yeah, um, yeah we've yeah. had preferred, uh, we've had preferred, sorry to echo crazy, <laughs> we, you know, we've had um, preferred specifications for, for installers and that's actually that's turned out really well you know we've we've said you know if you're uh, employing uh, if there's like underemployed communities or if you're a union or if you you know if there's like a local like you said a local uh, a local um, um, certification from a technical college etc cetera, etc cetera. I think that I think that's a really good way to localize it um, and I think it goes, it, it, all of this can feed into the marketing as well, you know. We're creating jobs here for people who are from here. That's kind of, that, that rings true for a lot of people. That's, that's an important component of this. And, and to add on to that, um, there may be a situation where uh, a national vendor from California bids, but they're still going to use local installers, local electricians. Um, I think the building code requires such an installation to be done by a, a licensed electrician. Um, so a lot of these types of specifications might just be a matter of course. I had a question on, um, it's page five under uh, section B, installer. Uh, it just in, in parentheses had noted, well I guess this is kind of what made me think of my question where it says the example of 50 kilowatts of contract capacity goal, et cetera, um, made me think of two things. Um, one is I, I assume that the people who are, would be responding to this RFP would be knowledgeable enough the, of the market to know that they're going to have to have 80 kilowatts in order to qualify for the ESREC um, auction. And then the other question was uh, what are the pros and cons of our specifying what our goals are for the program here, the 100 watts versus 200 watts? I'm sorry, kilowatts. I, 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 I don't know whether the actual specified goal into the RFP. Yeah, at this point. I'm not sure if there's if that's. I, I don't know what the pros and cons are of doing that one way or the other. But it it just made me think of whether 
there would be some benefit to doing it or whether there would be a downside to doing it? Presumably, if you have a really different, if, you, if you're talking about multiples, 100 versus, uh, 100, uh, versus 200 target, you know, really big differences, you actually could get really different pricing. Um, so that's something to pay attention to. You know, if you really think you're going to wind up with, uh, you know, a much greater participation, it's worth paying attention to because it, it could really change the nature of these bids. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree. You know, we see um, additions of 50 kilowatts drop the, the price per watt down by uh, six cents at a time. So it, it really, it makes a big difference. So yeah. Peter, in your experience, you do have communities uh, kind of set a non-binding target, right? So they're indicating what they what they think uh, will be achieved locally. And then the, the vendors who are bidding have to s sort of think about, uh, do take on some of that risk because they're thinking about, you know, what the likelihood is of they're meeting that target. And of course, it's non-binding in the sense that nobody's on the line in terms of whether they're going to pay more uh, except the, the installer. So what are th some of the lessons learned on that side? I mean, do you see that um, installers are willing to sort of take on a huge amount of risk? I mean, it seems like then communities would be, would start creating targets that were aspirational. Well, I think in terms of this question, the real issue is whether or not we specify. So, if we have a if we have a goal of 100 kilowatts, we shouldn't probably we should change the example to not to 50 watt 50 kilowatts because that that doesn't make sense. If the if the basic if the base level for the bid is 80, um, we sh we shouldn't have 50 kilowatts as the example. It kind of creates this implication that we want to have a price break at 50 kilowatts that doesn't really align with the rest of the program. So we should maybe do, a, it change the, it, at least change the example to 100 kilowatts um, and, and then what price break that would represent. But then also the, the question is whether there are pros, or what, what are the pros and cons to having a specific to asking for specific price breaks at 100 kilowatts, 150 kilowatts, 200 kilowatts, et cetera. Um, I think what we'll see is the installers will recognize that they have to be competitive in their pricing as volume goes up. And I think that'll actually, I think that'll benefit the consumer in the end. I don't think it's going to, it's going to turn anybody away. I think it's going to make installers give a little bit more thought to their pricing um, as they go. As the as the project or as the program uh, escalates. Are there any other questions or comments? So did we? I'm I'm sorry. I, I wasn't clear on whether we wanted to incorporate uh, preferred. Um, qualifications like IGBA, Green Jobs, Community College Tech Certified? Maybe what, um, maybe everyone can uh, think about that question tomorrow and email me and we can put together a short list and we'll, uh, the technical assistance providers will think about what makes sense and maybe we'll have a, a short list of preferred. Great, any further discussion? All right, uh, then we're done with our continuing business. We have no new business before us this evening. Do we have any announcements? Morgan. Uh, we're hosting a community, <laughs> no, I forgot, community conversation on energy conservation on campus for local businesses. We're uh, looking at trying to identify what are the hurdles between um, business owners and implementing energy efficiency programs or participating in uh, regional programs such as the Urbana Champaign Energy Star Challenge. And that is going to be October 20th on campus from 12 to 3.30.
If you are an interested business, please email sustainability at illinois.edu. Thank you. Other announcements? All right, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? I will second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, we're done. And thank you very much to uh, uh, Peter on the line there, and uh, of course all our guests who are here uh, in person. It was great to have your feedback, and it's great working with you on this. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I'm really excited about this project, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Peter. Thank you.